videos, three devotionals to spend the time to explain a little bit about what Jesus did on the mount when he was with his disciples and how the people likewise if you notice at the end of the Sermon on the Mount they had heard his doctrine and they were astonished at what he had said because he spoke as one with authority you see he is our authority as much as we like to use the example of saying the Word of God is our authority well Jesus one of the titles that he has is he is the living Word of God or he is the Word of God made manifest in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that all sounds kind of like spooky or maybe science fiction type. But you see, the Jew had worshipped the Word to such a degree that the Torah was living and alive. And people use these images of fiery writing in the sky. And they like to describe the Word as being greater almost than God himself because the word is alive and living and it does come inside of us and it does cause us change but it's because God spoke it but Jesus said I am the word of God look in the volume of the book look in the volume of the Torah look in the volume of all of this this is who I am I am the word and so there was an emphasis that was placed upon the word in those days as opposed to the person and Jesus is the fulfillment of the Word of God so as he came and as he spoke when he spoke with authority he countermanded by saying you have heard it said meaning that they had read the Torah in the Bible and that God had spoken these words and they existed and now Jesus is making a criteria saying but I say unto you there was no doubt that only God could change what was being said and that either Jesus was a prophet saying what God had said or he was speaking with his own authority. The reality is the Son of God was given that ability to cause us who are under his covering or his grace to look to him as our foundation so that whenever we don't understand what's in the word of God we need to look to the word himself to explain it to us it is simple and Jesus said it was he said I'm speaking it I'm saying it these are my words in Matthew chapter 5 all the way through chapter 8 we have the Sermon on the Mount when you look at the end of it he says every person that does these things of mine I would liken unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock that when the storms came hey no problem but every person that doesn't do what I'm saying right now if you don't do these things, then your house is like a sand, and it's going to be washed away. People forget that, because that's why we're going to emphasize that a lot in these devotionals, is to look at the end of the book and realize that at the end, he spoke a lot of what he meant in saying, look, these are what I'm saying. This is what I mean. There is no doubt. There is no mistake. There is no sudden mysterious meaning or some simile or metaphor. We're looking at the Word of God as the Word of God says it is. So, in Matthew, we know that the disciples came up and he was sharing with them. But we also know because at the end of Matthew, it says that in chapter 8, and he, or it says in actually the end of chapter 7, that it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. That speaks volumes when you realize that it's not just for the disciples, as some people like to say. It's not just for people who want to have a nice idea of, let's just go with the philosophy of Jesus, or let's just go with the thoughts that Jesus said, or let's just make Jesus' words into some kind of credo, credo that we could live by, as though it were some mystical Eastern philosophy, because it's not. Jesus made it blunt. He made it direct, and he made it clear. So when you read, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's contained in chapter 5. It's written in verse 3. When those that numbered it decided to place it in context in that way. But you know, Jesus said these were sayings of mine. These were statements that he was making. What is blessed? Why are the poor in spirit blessed? And one of the things that people forget is that the Jew 
had a blessing according to the Pharisees and according to the scribes that we know that we look back on when reading Josephus or we even look at the Talmudic writers that tell us that religious expression in those days was always a blessing unto God, that they need to make a brecha. They needed to make everything into blessing God for God giving it to us. So they would use the word baruch, which was similar to what you would say, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kirishanu b'mitzvotah v'tzvahonu v'lehalik eshel ha'shabbat. Whenever a Jew speaks those words, he's blessing the Shabbat. He's, he's saying, you know, that God's presence he wants there in the midst of what's going on. So he would bless it so that God could, by his holiness, send his Holy Spirit to be divine in the activities that were going on. But Jesus did something contrary to the Jewish custom of blessing those things that they wanted God in. Jesus was bringing God into the midst of things that would not necessarily normally incur a blessing. If you can find a brecha for a poor in spirit, let me know. If you want to try to find a blessing that's in Jewish custom or Jewish traditions that says that the poor in spirit are blessed, let me know. Because as far as I know, the reality of what Jesus is doing is blowing people's minds at this moment. He's not saying, oh, be happy because you're poor in spirit. <laughs> Guess what? Though you're poor in spirit, you get the kingdom of heaven, so you can be happy. It's not, oh, how happy. It's making a blessing. There is a reality here. Blessed. Just like you use the word blessed. Oh, God bless me or bless them or God take care of them or God care for them or God come. And in the midst of your worship, do you not use the same idea of God's presence there? That's what it means. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, because the kingdom of heaven had come to earth, and here it is, Jesus in the midst of them. He's standing right in front of them. He's declaring the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, look, here's a blessing for you. I am. Here's a blessing for you. God cares about the poor in spirit first, not the righteous, not the holy, not the ones who were the scribes and the Pharisees. Not today like our religious that we say, oh, well, you look at them. They're all perfect, so what do they need God for? No. Jesus always comes to those who are in need. Because a person who has no need doesn't desire, doesn't look for, doesn't ask, and doesn't want God in their life. They already presume or assume that they are having a personal relationship with God. And to that I would say, praise the Lord. If you are, continue on. And that's what Jesus did. Whenever the religious came to him, he said, okay, good. I'm glad you've kept the law. I'm glad that you've done those things that the law required of you. Now, take up your cross and follow me. Or sell your riches and follow me. Or leave behind your family and follow me. The truth is, the reality of what Jesus is saying is to those people who are following him at that moment. They've already made a determination and a choice. And that's what you have to decide in being poor in spirit. He's saying to you, if you're a baby Christian, praise the Lord. Guess what? You're the one that God wants to use. More so than those who have been saved for 35 years. I know, I'm one of them. And the reality is, is that we who were of the Jesus movement were thrilled when the Holy Spirit chose us and set us out as disciples and said, hey, blessed are you, in poor in spirit, because I'm going to use you because you're going to declare the kingdom of God. Everyone else is saying that God is dead. Everyone else is saying that religion has failed. Everyone else is saying that Christianity is a failure. So I'm going to use the hippies. I'm going to use the poor in spirit. I'm going to use the ignorant. I'm going to use the untrained, the unwashed, the unfed, the poor, the needy, those who would not be normally blessed. I'm going to give them the kingdom of heaven. And then I'm going to say to them, go out. And you know, history proved they did and guess what when you use the word born again now you couldn't have read about that back in the 60s and 70s and barely found it in any theological terms most denominations have rejected the term read their theologies read their statements of faith in those days religion had come to the place of being religious and forgotten relationship so when Jesus is saying blessed are the poor in spirit if you are and you should be as I am, poor in spirit, because we don't have the fullness of God. 
We don't have all that God intends for us. You can claim that, you know, as Jesus said in the back of the Sermon on the Mount, that you've done marvelous works in his name, that you've cast out demons in his name, and you've done all these marvelous things in his name. But the person of Jesus Christ himself, Jesus is the kingdom of heaven within you. When he comes inside you, he fills you to brim and overflows out of you his love, his mercy, his kindness, his tenderness, his gentleness, his meekness, and his ability to see what the kingdom of heaven really is. And do you know what that is? The kingdom of heaven is the poor in spirit. Look around you. You don't need to save the righteous. You don't need to clean up their act. You don't need to tell them what to do or how to be or how to live. They have Jesus. If they are in the kingdom of God, then they have Jesus and God himself directs them. So get off that reality of thinking that you are called to clean up God's people. Rather, deal with the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus speaking to you today in this devotion and sharing with you the poor in spirit. There's the kingdom of heaven. You want to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven? Guess what? The kingdom of heaven is the poor in spirit. Look around you. Ask yourself today. Walk around your world and in your circle of friends and in your fellowship and in your church and in your denomination and wherever you are. Who are the poor in spirit? I'd start in the mirror because I am. I know I am. I have not seen my, myself pick up a mountain and cast it into the sea. I have not walked on water yet, though I tried once. <laughs> In the Sea of Galilee, I went running and said, Lord, let's walk on water, and went splash. So, except the Lord build a house, the workmen laboreth in vain. Let's just say, look about you and find that the poor in spirit, as you treat unto them and recognize that they are the blessed, you will either become and recognize you are already poor in spirit, or you will set aside something very precious that you've missed in this scripture. And in what Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven has come unto you. Do you recognize it? Do you recognize it? It is the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is God. And he has come to those that are in need and are hurting and are wanting and are looking for Jesus. Today, look for the poor in spirit and tell them from God, himself from jesus christ himself from god in you oh how happy i am to meet you because you were blessed of god for god is giving you the kingdom of heaven in the form of jesus himself and let me tell you about it today